City University Television presents The American Theater Wing Seminars Working in the Theater This seminar, Design Hello, I'm Sandra Gilman, Chairman of the American Theatre Wing, with our Board President, Doug Leeds. Welcome to the American Theatre Wing's Working in the Theatre Seminars. We'll be back later in this program to tell you about the American Theatre Wing. But right now, let's join our distinguished panel. When we go to the theatre, sometimes, oftentimes, we don't remember that where we are is a dark room with no light, in an empty space, and everything that we see has to be created for us. Today, we have a panel of experts who bring the worlds of theater to life. I'm Howard Sherman from the American Theater Wing, and I'd like to introduce our panel of theatrical designers today. Beginning with, on my right, set designer Derek McLean. Next to him, lighting designer Peggy Eisenhower. Costume designer Jess Goldstein. Costume designer Carrie Robbins, and set designer David Korins. I want to start with a question that I've never asked the designers. So many of us in theater, I've found, began in high school or junior high being in shows. And as we grew older, we discovered that maybe that wasn't a way to make a living, but found other parts of the theater that we wanted to be in. I want to ask each of you, in turn, simply, when did you develop the interest in design, and was it always there, or were you segueing from another part of theater? Derek, I'll start with you. Well, I never wanted to be an actor. I uh, thought I was either going to be an archaeologist or an architect. And uh, so when I stumbled into designing scenery, uh, that was really sort of my introduction to the theater. And uh, I loved it immediately. And uh, after I designed one or two sets, I was pretty certain that that's what I wanted to do professionally. And at what age were you, did you? I was in college. Okay. So, Peggy? Uh, I, I was actually uh, uh, brought up in the music discipline, and I was being groomed to be a concert pianist. I didn't have the stomach for it, really. I didn't have the kind of the performance guts. And then I got involved in theater, and I sort of thought I wanted to maybe tap dance. Uh, and um, uh, at a very young age, I, I got to help out on the stage crew, and I found lighting and instantly knew that the musicality of it was, and the visual aspect of it, was what, what I wanted to do. I think I was 13. Jess? I, um, I started college as an art major, and, um, but never really could figure out what to do with that. And uh, by my second year, my sophomore year, I had found that uh, at Boston University, where I went to undergraduate school, they had a theater design program as well in the theater department. And I f somehow thought if I could major it in college, it would be, it somehow gave it some kind of um, uh, validity that for, as a career. And I always had seen shows. I grew up outside of New York and uh, had seen Broadway shows starting as a kid. And I oh, was always fascinated by it, but uh, I think was felt it was such a flamboyant kind of career to become a designer that uh, somehow finding you could, you could study it in, in college seemed to make it okay. So um, I, I, uh, I found, found it through, through school. Carrie? Well, I, um, I had a, a love of art since I was uh, maybe before three years old and uh, uh, drew on the walls. And my parents took me to a shrink <laughs> and said, she's not really that destructive. <clears throat> She just needs art lessons. So I was channeled into art at, at the age of three, I think was my first class, and I loved the theater. Um, I love tap dancing, <laughs> and, um, and I'm serious about it. I, have, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of or remember Henry Letang, a great sure. tap teacher. Sure. I studied with him, and I taught for Henry wow. in his studio here up until the day he, he fled the studio secretly. I guess there was something about the rent not being paid, but at any rate. And I went to college and I had two majors, which meant that there was this extraordinary number of credits, an art major and a theater major. And uh, 
the some kind teacher there said, you know, you're killing yourself. You've got 26 credits. That's really nuts. Um, you, could, you could put these together and do art in the theater. You could design in the theater. And then I, I went on actually to get um, accepted to Yale for design and accepted at a program at the Guthrie at the time for acting. And I said, well, acting is a silly profession. Mm -hmm. And it's so difficult. So <laughs> I'll go to Yale and I'll have the easier profession. <laughs> David? Uh, I was a performer. I can't believe I was the only actor uh, in high school. <laughs> and um, I, did, I wanted so much to play the part of Billy Bigelow in Carousel. Uh -huh. And I did not get the part. Uh, I got Jigger Craig in instead, and I sort of felt robbed. Uh, so I asked the... It's not a bad uh, part. It's not a bad part. It's a great part. I, uh, I asked parts. the musical director if there was something else I could do, and she said, well, maybe you could help out backstage. And I built my first set there. Uh, and then when I went off to undergrad, I felt, well, I don't want to go through that audition process ever again. So, uh, I, but I knew I wanted to still, still be in the theater, and I took a course called Beginning Techniques in Design, in which you learn a little about costume, a little about light, a little about set. and. Um, Pretty quickly, I thought that set design was the way I was going to go. But I didn't really think it was going to be a career choice. I just sort of was a kind of in the closet theater major. And then I went to the Williamstown Theater Festival as an intern. And uh, I was told that it was sort of like a theatrical boot camp and like get ready for crazy work. And it was going to be impossible. And, but it was going to be a real theatrical experience, a professional theatrical experience to see if I really wanted to do this. And about three days into it, I thought, wow, these are real designers. And this is how you make a living. And then I went forward from there, decided I was going to do it. Already in listening to you, the word college keeps coming up and the word training keeps coming up. I'll turn to Jess, because I know you teach at Yale, but is training absolutely essential for the jobs you do? I think it's part of it, for sure. I think that you need, uh, at least as a costume designer, I've, I've, I've taught for many, many years, and I, and I think that there's a certain you can get a certain kind of education at college that's very important, and it's, it's about learning all the basics and learning the craft. But in costume design, even when I employ my own students as assistants, I find that they learn so much more when they're on the street and on the job and in the theater with me in the studio. Um, it's just things that you simply can't cover in class. And not that there isn't the time, but it's, it's just you need to see how... Um, as a costume designer, you, you interact with the actor, with the director, with the, with the other designers, and that's something that somehow um, I don't think is taught, can really be taught in, in the classroom. Peggy? Uh, well, I, I went to Carnegie Mellon University, and uh, the great thing about the program there for me was that it was a conservatory-style training uh, within a university setting. So um, uh, my degree is actually in drama. It's not in lighting. Mm. Uh, and, um, and yet, uh, the conservatory type training was boot camp-like in, in the learning of the craft. But when you say drama, so it was a general theatrical training? Yes. It, 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 and was that involving all aspects? I mean, All you, aspects. So yeah. you, you've been trained, you've had general training in stage management and in acting and so on? Right, yes, a complete. Uh, and, and also it requires you to take courses outside of the College of Fine Arts so that you work in some other departments of the university. Um, but I also went to summer stock every summer, and I learned how to build scenery, and I learned how to um, uh, do whatever it was, the task at the theater that there was to do, because interns typically got rotated around. And um, uh, so I think those two things went hand in hand. I don't think if I had done one or the other, I wouldn't have been as prepared when I came to New York. And already it's been mentioned, you talked about uh, summer stock, you talked about Williamstown, which is certainly high-level summer theater. Is this like learning a trade in the old days in some ways? Is there an apprenticeship system that you're going through when you're coming up in this business, Derek? Absolutely. When I first came to New York, I assisted, um, I don't know, probably 10 or 12 different uh, designers. And it was fantastic because uh, uh, I just finished a three-year graduate program at Yale where Jess teaches. And and uh, uh, you know that was very centered on drawing. Uh, everything was about sketching and drawing, drawing scenery, drawing costumes, and um, going out and working and assisting people. I learned so much about the business and how people uh, interact with producers and directors and deal with budgets and 
how they negotiate and how they how they handle difficult situations. And so uh, I found that enormously helpful and seeing the different styles that these different designers had. It's funny, I, I did not do a lot of assisting when I got out of school. I started designing pretty quickly. And it's the, my biggest regret, oddly, is that I didn't assist um, some major designers and really learn how, how, how things are done. And it's something that's taken me many, many years to kind of figure out on my own. And it's something that uh, would have been so beneficial for me. Um, I think it, it is just helpful to, you know, when you, when you can work with people who really ma are masters at what they do. Right, and you're in a very safe position as the assistant. Right. You're not directly on the line. Mm -hmm. you're, so you, you can hide, and if you're smart, you mm -hmm. can observe. Mm -hmm. I don't think we've got the formula worked out for teaching. I taught for a zillion years at NYU. And I think maybe we're a little bit too um, hyper-intellectual. Mm -hmm. And um, and maybe we are there's a kind of a denigrating feeling that I hear back from the students about learning about technical things as if someone else will solve that. I mean, in in costumes, the the tactile part. I mean, how do you teach how do you teach fabric and hand and drape um, and using the color of fabrics and them mixing under under lighting conditions? in a classroom. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got to either get out there and do it or, or watch some skilled people do it and be smart enough to figure out what's going on. Well, I think in all of our disciplines, it's so much about, obviously, it's about collaboration and it's about how you interact with people. And that's something that even though in, in, at Yale, of course, they, the students design productions there and they get that experience, which they all really love, it's, it's, it's um, being in a bigger arena and seeing, seeing how, how, how it, um, how you really kind of have to observe and listen and, and, and deal with, with all kinds of pressures that you can, I think you can only get in the, in the real world. It's not, not as, as protected as it is, of course, at, at school. Well, following a little on what you were saying, how, what's the balance between the artistic and visual aspects of what you're doing and the technical aspects? Because as you talk about draping and things like that, certainly, Peggy, you're working with electricity. You have to have some knowledge of what you can and can't do with that. How do you find the balance and how do you learn the balance? I'll start with Peggy. Well, uh, in my uh, uh, career lifetime, lighting has com become completely digitalized. I mean, it's completely changed. From, from when I was a ki like a kid. And um, one thing is that you have to keep up. I mean, I think the lighting designer has, has uh, uh, his share of the Renaissance position of having to be completely artistic and completely technical. I mean, we can't, they're hand in hand and they can't, I, I don't think I could be a lighting designer if I didn't understand how, you know, optics worked and how electricity works. and and um, now how, how digital information works. And so uh, we read. I mean, it, the, the, um, we try not to fall behind uh, uh, on, on the technical side uh, while we feed ourselves on the artistic side and try, mm. to, you know, try to have new ways of thinking about it, new ways of imagining color or light or, you know, but that's, that's like the other side of the brain for us. So. Well, David, do you have to really, you can design a set of stairs and say, I'd like a set of stairs here, but how responsible are you for whether that can actually be constructed in the way that it needs to be and that it'll hold the appropriate loads and connect and so on? I think it varies. I, I, luckily, I'm not responsible for whether it actually does hold the load, um, but I, I think that... Well, again, the idea of there's design for the stage versus, say, architecture, where sure. architects have to know absolutely whether, whether it will work. And like in architecture, we, we deal with a bunch of engineers who will tell us whether we have crazy ideas, and they often do. I think my stance is that I try to always figure out or give a really good, solid solution to, to what I'm proposing. I, I don't like to sort of throw something out there that I know is just a total stretch. Um, I mean, we're not responsible for the building of it. We're just responsible theoretically for the design ideas. But we, I study, I, I read, I go and see other people's work. I, I get inspired by things I see it, you know, when I walk down the street. And then I try and be as risky as possible and as imaginative as possible. But I also, like I said, try and give a pretty solid solution when, uh, to what I'm proposing. See, I've always been jealous, secretly, of uh, set designers because 
a set designer has traditionally, uh, once the model is made, correct me if I'm wrong, you guys, um, there is a time when there is drafting done, which is design drafting. So taking an image and an idea, things which can be very vague and artistic, it is then rendered into fact. It's rendered into line. And then they even have a technical, a even more technical person or persons, right, who can draft a very comprehensive, mechanically correct, tested for stress loads, etc. That's another department. Costume designers, on the other hand, have no, um, we have no such firm, finite drafting. Um, we have a sketch, which since there are no rules, it could be as loose as this, and somebody gets to interpret it, um, or it could be maniacally tight and extraordinary, but it is, there, there is, that is the final product, that is the drafting, that is the, the contract with the director. It's going to look like this. You hope he or she is not colorblind or a visual, you know. Um, and there are no interim, it goes immediately to the shop. Numbers get attached to it. So as opposed to when things are bid for set designers, they're, they're bidding on a very finite, <coughs> comprehensible, measurable, specked out thing. Ours right. is so much looser than that, and so it's well, a little yeah. scary. I think it's also for a costume designer, things can change completely in a costume fitting with an actor True. that you know, doesn't, either doesn't look right in the costume that you've sketched or, or has a strong opinions, which of course often happens. And it's so much a, um, it's a costume design, a, a costume is a kind of a thing in motion that until it gets on it's stage, fluid for so quite many some things time. Can, can change and happen with it. And I find even today directors are let, I think, no, I think directors have become much more aware of that. And so I, I find that they don't, they're not even so interested in looking at costume sketches anymore. Hmm because they know it's going to change and they don't want to, and they also don't want to feel that they have to commit to anything. I mm -hmm. think they like the feeling that costumes, maybe unlike scenery, can be, can evolve and change and as, the, as, the, as rehearsals change. And it can be a very frustrating thing. It can also be a very creative thing, depend, depending on the situation. Well, and sometimes you might not have the finances to support that sort of work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when you don't have money to make, I, I know there are some famous costumes that have been made over as many as nine times. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've personally never had that uh -huh. uh, allowed. I take a long time with the sketching, yeah. and, um, and I hate the fact that I take so long. Um, <laughs> I do. I, it, it is, it, it, it's a flaw in my character, but, um, but I can actually not even count on one hand how many changes mm -hmm. I've had to make. So I feel, in a sense, I'm, I'm efficient with the producer's money. Now, if the director, and there are directors who say, D don't show it to me, I don't want to even see it, then I generally go out and get, you know, you get the product, and, he, and here are 10 dresses which make sense, let's look at them together, or let's look at them on a person together. Well, you started this with a, with a contrasting yourself with a set designer, so now, Peggy, how do you see the work that you get to do and, and what you can prepare and then what it evolves into in relation to these other disciplines? Well, uh, my experience is that lighting uh, is the biggest leap of faith that a producer takes because they really don't <laughs> see true. anything in advance. I mean, you know, we don't do sketches that, that show the quality of it because if, I mean, we can occasionally storyboard something, but that's sort of a, more of an Daniel. architectural image. It doesn't, it's ephemeral. It, it doesn't have the quality of light, and it doesn't inspire the organic response in a human being if it's paper, because the medium that we're working in is light. Right. So um, we do all the technical drawings and all the technical things first with a little cloud above our heads uh, of ideas, and uh, they take the form of um, seeing in the mind's eye snapshots or moving images, and we try to articulate it. Uh, and uh, most of the work that we actually do is in the theater and is on demand. So it's, it's, it's live on demand. You know, you kind of can't have a day where you're kind of sitting there waiting for the day to end and you don't have any ideas coming. The, you have to have the ideas then. I mean, you can prepare for them, you can imagine them, 
but you have to craft them live while everyone's waiting. So uh, it has uh, the least amount of, of um, expression prior to th the fact, and it has uh, a tremendous amount of pressure <laughs> in the moment to be creative and to deliver creativity. And of course, because it can change, because it's made to change, uh, lighting also has to satisfy uh, everyone else's needs, all the other collaborators' needs, to make sure that the costume looks like the perfect shade of green and the set has the right amount of reflection to it and that the director possibly does or possibly does not have a feeling about the correctness emotionally. You know, and so it, there's a there's a there's a coaxing uh, that comes with that, or some directors who just say yes, that's it, that's what I want. So it's um it's a pretty uh, it's a pretty airy process for us, and we 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 don't overanalyze it. it. It flows, it just comes out, and that's I guess that's that's the experience part that plays into it. I think the challenge for all of us is that you know although we have a certain amount of technical knowledge about various things, you know, about fabrics and how garments are made or about electricity or about, you know, ideas about structure and things like that. I think that the biggest challenge for all of us is to try to stay in the kind of artistic place with a play or a musical or an opera for as long as we possibly can. And, uh, you know, sometimes I, I think we probably all feel this way, that the uh, practical considerations, the technical considerations, and particularly the, the, the budgetary considerations are always conspiring to um, yes. sort of interfere with the, the, the art thinking that goes on. And, uh, and so I personally am, am always trying to shove all the technical stuff aside as much as I can and try to stay uh, thinking really about where we want the show to be artistically as much as, as, as possible, well, for as long as possible. Let's follow that thought then. How do you begin a conversation with the director and then with each other about creating the visual world of a show? What are the first steps? I'll, I'll turn it right back to you, Derek. Sure. Well, uh, oftentimes the set designer and the director start really early. Those meetings are often before they meet with other designers, not necessarily, sometimes they are, and, and they're often before the show is cast. And what's exciting about them is when those meetings first happen, uh, often the director doesn't really know how he or she wants to do the show. And so part of those early design meetings is really kind of an exploration of, you know, what is the show going to be like? And um, most directors I know have a lot to say at the beginning. Uh, when you sit down, they have no trouble just talking about what they want it to be. But if, if, if they don't start talking, then one of the first things I would say is, what do you want the show to be like? How do you imagine this experience being for the audience? Or what's your fantasy? What's your, describe your fantasy production of this, of this play. David, what's your approach? I agree. I mean, I, I start with lots of conversations, oftentimes before other collaborators come in uh, with the director. And everyone is different. I think that some people come in with a lot of ideas. Some people come in with research, pictures a movie, some other reference, and I feel like I just start, I mean I oftentimes say that what we do is really all about being a psychiatrist, because I just so much start with who the characters are, what was going on five minutes before we meet them, what's happening in their life, what's the space, what's the world they're creating, why would that thing be there, who are they, you know, so much about character development and just trying to figure out exactly what Derek said about where are they, what's the world, what do we want to do, how do we want people to receive it and respond to it. And I find myself just asking directors millions of questions, tons. And of course, we've, I've jumped right past the playwright. How much, when you're looking at a script, are you responding to any specificity that's been put in that script about what the set might look like or the costumes? I rarely see a script that is specific about lighting. But is that something you're really going to hew close to? Or are you really taking your cues from what the director's response to that is? Of course, if they're living or dead, that might yeah. alter what we say. Shakespeare doesn't call. <laughs> right, but, uh. right. Um, I, I, I think most of us uh, would, would start with us several times through the text, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, even on a musical that's rhyming June, moon, and spoon, uh, you're going to still I think we would sit down, I, I make notes, I make a big chart because I like Excel. Um, and um, I, I try to write down anything that would, that would have to do with the character. Because I think, I mean, the, the average 
costume designer should be able to create a costume uh, that without any text coming out on the stage, you should know um, probably uh, what they do for a living, what time of day it is, what century you're in, uh, whether it's uh, cold or warm or morning or, or night. Know, or even uh, sometimes I think just a practical question, like where did this person get their clothes? Where do they shop? Where do they buy their clothes? Or where, who made the clothes if it's a period show? And, you know, right. Just, There's just a bunch of straightforward information that we have to be in control of. Then in the conversations with the director and certainly if there's music going, um, and choreographers, we, we can move to, I, can, I think, maybe a more a deeper level or a, a more metaphoric level because, because clothing and the way, especially, I think, groups of clothing or, or blocks of actors grouped together can create a kind of subliminal um, mood or feeling or uh, uh, so that you might be able to suggest someone thinks they're sexy or someone is interested in someone on the other side of the stage by what they've chosen when they got up to put on that day. So it's, um, it's a kind of a wonderful, interesting uh, psychology that you can bring to it. And that's the kind of stuff you're going to talk about to the director. Sometimes I find the director say, well, you'll talk to the actor because the director might be interested in a more global approach. The, the actor will talk with you for hours about what's in her closet, mm -hmm. right? So by the time you finish that conversation, you, you probably know the whole closet. So if something doesn't work, you can go into your mental picture of the closet and pull out another dress. So when do you start talking to each other? Derek has suggested that the set designer conversation may be the first one and may happen many months out. What's the next step? Is it about the set designer talking to the lighting designer? Is it about the costume designer being shown what the set is going to look like? What do you find uh, that experience is? I'll ask Jess. I think it depends on the director and how the director wants to handle those kind of you know, the, the collaboration and the meetings. And I think very often it is, uh, I do find it's what Derek said, that the set designer meets with the, uh, with the, set, uh, the set designer meets with the director quite early on and, um, or maybe there'll be like an initial conversation with all the designers if you can manage to get everybody in the same city at the same, in the same room. Um, but then the detailed um, conversations go on between the the director and the set designer. And I sometimes feel like, oh, I wish I could have heard some of what was said there and uh, feel like I'm missing out and I have to catch up. And you, I, I find as a costume designer sometimes a director isn't very interested in going into a lot of detail that they, I don't know if they, they like to, I think it's as Carrie said, they like to trust that you will kind of work it out with the actor and uh, you know, kind of just catch, catch up with things. And, um, and I don't know if they, again, if it's, it's like they're, it's almost as if the director is afraid to in, intrude on your relationship with the actor and say something that the actor will then dis disagree with. Or sometimes it's, if the play isn't cast, the director doesn't know who's playing the role and then they, until, until the role is cast, they can't talk about too much about yeah. the, uh, what, what the character is wearing. I think fi for me, it's, sometimes it's really more about getting the director to talk about the character than about the costume. I don't, it's not that I need the director to tell me what they're wearing, it's just, just tell me who you think the character is and more about the character. But are there issues even of color, of what are your choices either suggested or limited by what you've seen coming out of set designers? Well, to me, it's because I spend a certain amount of time drawing it, I, I feel bereft if I don't know the general tone or feeling or mood of the color of the, the largest, I don't care, the small stuff, but the largest <clears throat> general feeling that's, that is going to be warm or cool, um, uh, rough hewn or slick and shiny. And I will actually um, try to suggest or make myself a background of what's described. I mean, I would prefer to be in the original conversations, but like Jess says, it, it doesn't always happen because we come in after the fact. So anything I can look at, any, any paint swatch that fell on the floor, you know, I would take it and scan it and put it in and try to, that when I'm thinking of the clothes, that I'm setting them within the landscape of, of what it's going to be, as opposed to a white piece of paper. And as set designers, are you thinking about what 
the people on the sets you're creating might look like, or are you totally focused on the, that that set aspect of the of the physical world that's being created? I mean, I feel like we we are, uh, of course. I, I we are a little bit lucky because we do sort of come in first most often. It's rare the director says, "I know everyone's wearing red. Now let's start and design the set." Um, so we are thinking about that. I more think about the light, to be honest with you, what the character is going to look like. Is it going to be a bright show, a dark show? Is it going to be, you know, how that's going to feel? Um, but we are, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, the great thing about the theater is it's always scaled to a, a real person. It's not a film. And so you can't have a set without a body on it. Uh, it doesn't become a set until someone inhabits it. And so you're always thinking about how people are going to look relative to the size and scale and feeling of it. If it is it going to be rough? Is it going to be slick? All of that. How people are going to react and look. Um, so yeah, I, I think that we are. Right, I always Derek? think of it as a performance uh, space. I mean, that, to me, that's a set is first and foremost a performance space. Even if it's a completely realistic set, uh, it only works if uh, the set will only actually work if, if, if the performances on it can be are allowed to be strong. We can't control whether the performances are strong or not, but we, um, you know, it's certainly possible for scenery to get in the way of that. And uh, so I don't necessarily think about what the color of the costumes is going to be or what the color of the lighting is going to be, but I feel like I always have to leave room for those things. Um, that there has to be a space in the color palette, probably a big space in the color palette, available for the clothes. And uh, oftentimes what that means is that I have to restrict the number of colors that I use in the set. I mean, I think I do that instinctually. So that um, uh, there tends not to be a riot of colors there. There's, there, you know, that a set might be all blue or predominantly blue. So that that leaves a place for the costume designers to use other colors and make them really stand out. Although it might forward. be very beautiful to have a series of blue shade costumes in front of blue, Absolutely. brilliantly lit. <laughs> See, we are, both of us, uh, dependent on the lighting designer to, to do the chiaroscuro, to do the modeling. Yeah, there are never any rules. Yeah. If, if you make any rules, then you're doomed. That's right, you're right, yeah. Uh, I would offer that uh, if you took an informal poll of lighting designers, that 99% of them would say, I want to be at that first meeting. And uh, we don't always understand why there is the separation between the director and the set designer f being first. Uh, I think it takes us as lighting designers, and I, again, I, I think I can speak for a fair number of lighting designers, it takes uh, a long time for us to imagine the lighting and what it will, how it will change. Because we think of it as a, uh, nowadays, think of it as a, a moving liquid plasma substance on a stage. It used to be that lighting was a series of snapshots that got changed over a certain amount of time. But now lighting is changing, can be changing and breathing in every moment of a performance, maybe with the audience knowing and maybe with the audience not being aware of it, but nevertheless being affected by it. And what's affected that change, just so, so people understand? I think one of the big things that's affected the change is that um, we have gone from manual control of lighting in which human beings actually physically changed handles to change the amount of you know, voltage going through a, a light. Uh, to, um, to digital control, which is signal, like, a, like a, an operating system in your office, let's say, and how you take, it, how you take uh, the internet into your computer. So um, it's a, a, a massive amount of uh, digital headroom that we have in order to create lighting that's constantly changing. And um, the initial meetings that you go to that, and the discussions that go on in those meetings help us understand what the play is about and what the space is about. And I agree with you that it is, it is to us, it is a dynamic space. It is a space that has its own energy to it and that the lighting is going to pierce that space with its own energy. And it becomes a very metaphysical affair as far as, as we see it. So sitting quietly in those initial meetings feeds the lighting designer. Even if we don't say anything, I know there's a, there's a fear that the lighting designer will comment and say, well, we don't want that all there because that's in the way of my stuff. 
<laughs> well, you'll, you know, we'll comment or not later anyway, but the thing is, we, the, the deference is to allow you to have that discussion. We'd just like to hear it. We'd like to be, to witness it, because we'll come away with some images and we'll come away with some ideas from it. And those little kernels develop in the mind's eye into images for, you know, for, for what we can bring to it. So we, we like to hear the dialogue between the director and the designer. And ultimately, what is the dialogue between all of you? How much are you talking to a lighting designer? How much are you talking to a costume designer? Or are you all talking through the director who mediates what you do? Jess? Well, again, I think it just depends on each, each situation can be different. And maybe it also depends on my, how, how often I've worked with a set designer, a lighting designer, how, how, you know, how, how, that, how you interact. Um, obviously, you, you always want to see where this, what, the, what the set design looks like. And I, it's kind of what Peggy was saying. I think also for costume designers, we would all like to be at those first meetings, too, even though we're not always invited. And not necessarily to, to put in our two cents or, or anything. But because so, in the end, you do see what the design is. So it's not like you're, you're being left out of that. But it would, it's, it, you always feel it would be nice to know how, how it got there. And, and that's what you, sometimes you feel like you're missing by not being at the early meetings. Um, but in the end, of course, you, uh, you have to you know, keep up and, and see, see, all, see, see what the set designer is doing. I think often you know, a lighting designer will ask me for either for a set of sketches or sometimes occasionally for swatches of things if, if that helps them. Not so much anymore, though, because again, I, 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 my impression is that lighting designers kind of, it is much more, you can change things so quickly now on, you know, in tech rehearsals. It's not like it all has to be so planned out in advance. I, it's the one thing, a costume design, unfortunately, we're very far behind. <laughs> Nothing is computerized, really, in terms of making the clothes or, or getting the clothes on stage. It's still done the old-fashioned way, and it's not, it's not as easy to change right, it backwards. in the theater. <laughs> no, so um, you, you can't push a button and change the color of a costume. Um, on stage, it, 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 you have to, you know, it all has to be redone, and that's that. That's well, you can do that in the in the drawing. drawing if yes, you're drawing yes. in the computer, you're a, a click yeah. away, so yeah. that's more convenient. Yeah. I think I think eventually costume designers might take a little more advantage of computer technology. I've been now drawing patterns. Mm. You put them on a disc, you send it to a company, and they print the fabric. Mm. So I think that's very very neat to be able to have that transfer of information. And they can go on uh, Silk Organza or Chiffon or you know, various, not on everything, but, um, but that's very exciting that that can be done, technically speaking. So more and more, but we are probably the slowest. We still have people who do the, the hand arts. You know, we're very 19th century. We, are, we have beaters employed. We're probably almost the only industry employing um, hand knitting, beading, um, uh, hand painting of fabric. Who else does that? Uh, so on one hand, that's keeping a lot of skills alive that would, that would die. Who else would make a corset, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I see very often on English productions that they simply refer to a designer referring to the set and costume designer. I, don't, I haven't seen set lighting and costume together. Mm. Is there a specialization here that's kept them apart? And are you, do you have a sense of why the English might, might see it as more integrated? David? Well, I think that we all in school learned all the different disciplines, most of us. And, and I feel like some people have a proclivity to go and be a set designer, and some have wanted to be a costume designer. And others just want to be a designer. I mean, I consider myself just a designer. I just happen not to program the lights, and I happen to not design the clothes, but I think about them a lot. And I, I guess I feel like, you know, I've been approached to do sets and costumes before. I like the other brains in the room, personally. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that people like to design both because they want to have, really have a say in the overall production and what it feels like as a whole. Um, you don't really have that say. You can suggest, you can strongly suggest. Mm -hmm. You can sit behind a tech table and nudge, but you don't have that say, and I enjoy that. I, I think that having the other people in the room is a great asset. So I'm not really sure. Um, I mean, there, I think there are advantages and disadvantages to both. Certainly, 
you wouldn't be excluded from the first meeting if you were the same. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> I think it's great having um, you know people who are fantastic costume designers working on a production, and um, I, I, I like Dave. I, I was asked to design costumes uh, for a couple of things that I designed sets for early on in my career, and uh, I did it a few times, and I stopped doing it, and you know subs subsequently declined any offers, not that I get that many, to design costumes, but I, I, I don't think like a costume designer. Um, I think like a set designer. Mm -hmm. And I think about space all of the time. You know, I walk down the street and I will see a building, I'll see a courtyard, I'll see a space, and I will respond to that, I'll take a note, I will think about how I could use that in a set. But costume designers think about character all day long, I think. And it's a totally different way of, mm -hmm. of thinking. And quite, quite frankly, I think some people are good at that and some people aren't so good at that and what's great about a good costume designer is that they are so focused on on character and what, what makes a character <laughs> well notwithstanding the comments about other people in the room to, to finish up this thread I want to ask one final question which is have you ever wanted to direct yourselves boy not me I think it's a terribly hard job it it demands a huge amount of energy and I, I have been lucky enough to, to watch some terrific directors. I have only admiration for it, especially those who are able to remain calm, who always seem to have a, a, a sense of humor about some you know, pretty crazy things that go on. I mean, costume designers certainly deal with the folks on a very intimate level, but we don't do it eight hours a day for four weeks or six weeks. And I think that's tremendously hard. Uh, so we've got the, the easier end of that stick. Peggy? Uh, it's not my thing. It, it's certainly not my thing. Um, uh, I, I uh, find myself in, in larger and larger productions with terribly big departments. Uh, and I am the director of that department. I'm the d director of the lighting department. and. Um, that's enough for me. In other words, for, for me, it feels like um, that's the, 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 my, my range of expertise uh, lends uh, my psychology to that group uh, that can support them and that can um, bring them to do their best work. Uh, but I don't have it in the other disciplines. I don't have it outside of, of uh, visual, uh, visual realm. So uh, I don't think I would be that well suited for it. I'd like to actually ask another question related, because um, uh, lighting and projection now are being uh, done sometimes by separate people and sometimes by uh, one person on a show. And we often get asked to do projections as well. And Explain I Explain what you mean by projections. Projections is, is uh, putting an actual image or uh, abs however abstract or however real, putting an image projected with light on, on the stage. And um, it's, it's a very fine line between lighting and projection now because of the way that light can come out of, of, of lights and projectors. But now, uh, in addition, the um, light emitting diode panels are being used as scenery everywhere around the world. And I guess my question, what I'd really like to know is, uh, how do you feel about using uh, lighting panels as, as scenic elements, and who would then control the content that would play on those, on those panels? Because it becomes, it becomes a, a join between scenery lighting, I and mean, we think of it as lighting because, it's, because it, it deals in the medium of light. Um, do, you, do you guys have any thoughts about that? I think that, that you know, those things are, are a tool that can work in some productions, and, and, uh, and, and you know, that, that they're, they're not gonna, I don't think, I don't see those as being a panacea um, or you know, ultimately replacing scenery. The thing about a, an LED screen or any kind of projection screen is that it's a flat surface, and they can be very, very effective for, giving you information quickly, simply about where you are or what something looks like. You know, um, they're fantastic that way, but they are not, uh, they don't create dimensional space. That's true. They are essentially a more sophisticated version of a backdrop. So, you know, an LED screen or a projected thing is, is uh, to me, is like the modern, uh, the modern version of a 19th century painted drop. 
And they can do a lot more now because they can change images more quickly and you can, you know, you're not reliant on the skill of a particular painter to paint them. You can put anything that's on your laptop on, onto one of these screens. But they still don't, um, they're still just a backdrop and they don't necessarily create a space in which uh, you, know, you, 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 you really want to do performance. And I think the question of who controls the images is one of those things that has to get sort of slugged out um, <laughs> uh, you know, on any individual production. Um, uh, I just did a, a, a show that had a lot of projection on it, Lestat, uh, and that we had a British photographer, and he did all the, uh, he created all the uh, images for that, and you know he's he's an amazing photographer, and his images are very specific, and they 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 made a lot of sense for that particular world. What, but, when when the human being moves in front of that, does it does it have a sense of volume, or is it even more apparent that it's a flat thing? I think it depends on how it's used. I think it's, you know, it's interesting if you can make it so it's not so apparent that it's well, flat. Well, yeah, but, but I thought that that wasn't possible. Is it possible to... There's an awful lot of motion to the projections used in Lestat. Yeah, and I think also if you, if you have those images projected on more than one surface, um, ah. so that you can't quite tell where the surface is, you can, ah. you can actually, you can you confuse can that, you can fudge that a little right. bit. But, but it's, really not, it, it's really not true volume that exists not, no. in, in a three-dimensional space as people would. Would you agree with that, Peggy? Well, I mean, uh, uh, the, the LED technology exists in panels, but it also does exist in, in building blocks of spatial things. There have right. been, lo been lots of different yeah. kinds of surrounds and staircases, and you can, you, can, you, know, you can take a one foot square panel and you can build anything out of it. So it is just a building block, but I guess the, the thing that's interesting to me is that used with uh, uh, projection uh, screens, scrims, uh, different kinds of stage fabrics. How, how does that, you know, it, it seems to me that it offers a lot of possibility in terms of light becoming an element of scenery that we haven't really had before, mm. with the exception of light bulbs built in. Mm. And um, uh, I think it uh, could be a great tool. And not, not in terms of who slugging out who controls the images, but now we're joining a, 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 another uh, uh, area of design between what is traditionally two separate things is now can now kind of fuse together in the right environment, in the right collaboration. Well, we're going to take a very short break now and hear a few words about our work at the American Theatre Wing. The American Theatre Wing has played a vital role in New York's theatrical life for more than 60 years. We stand for excellence and we support education in the theater. Best known for creating the Tony Award, our work reaches beyond Broadway and New York. These seminar programs, which are supported by the Annenberg Foundation and the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, are an unequal forum for discussions with today's most creative artists. Downstage Center's in-depth interviews are heard on XM Satellite Radio. Our grant and scholarship programs support New York theater companies and theater students. And since we began, we have given away more than two and a half million dollars. Our theater intern group helps young people who are just starting in their careers build a professional network. And Springboard NYC is a two-week boot camp for aspiring actors from colleges across the country. All of the American Theatre Wing's educational and media programs are available for free, on demand, from our website, americantheaterwing.org. Now, let's return to the seminar. We've spent a lot of time talking about art, so to use the obvious segue, I want to move a little more to issues of commerce. How much does the budget impact what you're creating and how much are you dealing with finances in terms of the work that you're able to do and I'll I'll start with David because I know you've done recently a number of off-Broadway productions in in some smaller spaces and how does that limit what you do or how much is that an opportunity for what you do well I always try to just forget about the budget right off the top I, I start with two versions of the play. One is what is uh, the, the least you need to tell the story in each scene, uh, and the other is the sort of billion dollar production. And I just try and stick to the art, always. I don't think about the money. 
uh, and I try and come up with the essence of what it is that I want to try and do. And when I finally put pen to paper, when I finally have the model sort of underway, we have an idea of what it's going to be. I mean, after doing it for a long time, you get a sense of what things cost. And if you know you have a, such an outrageous idea, you'll never be able to afford it. Um, but most of the time, I feel like it's a very, very fine line between uh, commerce and art, and what it is that you can afford. You know, you can't by imagination. And I, f I feel like when you really get down to it, I try just to not think about that. And, and oftentimes it's really close, uh, you know, what it is that we can afford. We, we work with some amazing technicians and people that can figure things out. So when you come up with an idea, you say, uh, maybe it's not the perfect finish, maybe it's not a solid gold finish, but because we're really doing theater magic, people behind the scenes oftentimes can find ways to make what it is look like what you want it to look like. You know, so I, I try to not think about the money. But at what point does that come into play? At what point have you put pen to paper and drawn something? And who even says, well, we really can't do that? And is it, is it a, a producer that's imposing that? Or is the producer tells the director, sorry, we can't give, give what he wants, so you need to adjust your thinking? Derek? Well, it is the producer uh, or the producer organization that says that. Uh, uh, sometimes I'll say it to the director, but more, more often I think they just call the designer and say, look, uh, this is what you've done looks fantastic. We just can't afford it. And um, quite honestly, uh, I think I hear that on just about every production I work on at some point. And I think it's, it's part of the process. And, and to some degree, it can be healthy because what it forces you to do uh, is a little bit of what Dave was just describing, which is where you, you know, you have these two versions in your head. Uh, I think probably all of us work that way to some degree. And uh, you, when you, when you first hit those those budget conversations, you're forced to defend your ideas, and um, that that can be that, the, in a budget conversation. You're defending the idea. How yeah. Do you, how do you mean? Well, uh, for example, uh, let's say that you have a very um, since a staircase was the example we were looking at before, you have a very complicated, elaborate staircase, and uh, it costs a lot of money. And uh, the producer says, um, you know, look, that staircase is too expensive. Do you really need the staircase? Uh, uh, you know, could, could you do the show without a staircase? And so you're forced to. But, but do you go to the director and say, don't you really want that staircase? Can't you talk them into it? <laughs> no, no, we usually do it together. Uh, so uh, you know, and then you just go. You look at the play, and you say, "Well, actually, we do need a staircase." And uh, so then, then there's the decision. Well, all right, we have to have a staircase, but let's figure out uh, how we can save a few dollars on it, and and uh, and, and, so, and you figure out how to do that sometimes. And uh, uh, so it's a dynamic process, uh, sometimes pleasant and sometimes less pleasant. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I try to keep the director uh, from getting too involved in that because I know that the director has a lot of other things that they have to do and they don't want to spend a huge amount of time sitting around talking about the, about the budget. There are times when they have to be involved. There are you know, sometimes crucial staging things that are expensive and uh, uh, you know, it's really not up to me to say we could do away with them. The director has to step in and, and, uh, and make his case for something. Costume designers, is it the same scenario? You know, I was going to say, I think what maybe what people don't realize, too, is often budgets are not determined by a producer very carefully reading a script. So it's just, it's this is how much <laughs> money they, they have. Delicately. Yeah, and then they say, well, we have, we have, you know, this amount of money, so that much will go to the scenery, that much will go to the costumes, that much will go to the lights. It's not about figuring out, well, this actress needs to have four changes, and then he needs to have seven changes, and that's... You know that that's up and to you. And sometimes to they, uh, they the sometimes some producing bodies um, think that they will be able to have a less expensive show. I'm trying to be um, proper here um, <laughs> by uh, by having uh, a smaller show. Here's a show that we're only we're going to do it with seven characters, mm -hmm. and then when the costume designer. Um, gets the script, we see that these seven characters travel from 1910 through <laughs> to 1940. And now that's a large, if you did it straightforward and you just wanted to make the audience understand 1940s from 1910, it's vastly different on hair, on shoes, everything. And so that's automatically, however many stops the play makes, those 
if you just did it straightforward and just did your job of helping the audience identify where we are in this story, as opposed to a Brechtian, we are now in 1940, bring down the sign, um, that's adding to that costume budget. And then, this is a script I'm thinking that I read uh, recently, um, there, were, there was the rich lady uh, or family that became poor over this span of time. Well, that's not one dress. You know, that would be more than one. And a poor person became rich, so, and family to go along. So that was adding to it. And a couple of pregnancies and um, <laughs> a debilitating illness. So, that's, I mean, I'm not doing anything other than reading the script and trying to do what I think is the baseline, help the people playing these parts make those characters clear. I'm just going for clarity, and I had a huge number. And, and I do ask right up front, uh, because I have, no, I have no problem thinking whatever it is, I, I hope I can make it artistic. But I actually might not be able to do it. It might be such a debilitating number that I will do it, I will do a terrible job. Not just a bad job, a really over-the-top horrible job. And I won't be able to make the story clear, which is a, one of our baseline jobs, in, in costumes particularly. And, and sometimes you say, oh, well, you know, we could put everyone in um, a black uh, tie and tails, and we'll do hats. But you can't always do that, you know. So I actually ask the number, read the script, talk to the director, and do a little math. Mm -hmm. Then I, I do try to forget them and talk about the ideas and what it should be. But that number is staying with me. And I end up usually um, doing a fairly comprehensive budget um, after I've got it somewhat drawn. Uh, with numbers down to buttons, because I want to be able to talk to the money people and say, you know, it's the same, how important is the staircase? Well, how important is it that she does or doesn't look pregnant, or he does or doesn't look ill? Can I skip that? Just, you know, just say it, just act it, you know? Uh, which is uh, sometimes a possibility, you know, and becomes, it becomes a style, and then they say, oh, how clever you are, you know? See, you didn't need that budget, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> See, look how good you are. And Peggy, as we were talking about technology, as technology continues to evolve you know, in lighting, does, has that made it easier to do more for less, or is it about constantly acquiring or dealing with new technology and the costs stay the same, you can just do more with it? Well, everything always goes up in price. So <laughs> the price is going up, everybody. It probably is in everyone's department. It's just inflation in the way the world is. Um, the, what we do uh, to begin the conversation uh, with a producer is we, do, uh, we, we go to the producer to get what we call their charge, which is how much time do we have to put it up? How many men do we have to put it up? Um, does it need to travel? Does it need to fit in a, in, inside a doorway of a certain size? Does it need to be in a certain kind of box? all of the sort of practical things that the lighting system may eventually have to do or may have to do uh, on this uh, particular installation. But on top of that, we determine how far away from the stage is the farthest audience member. Because when you're sitting uh, 100 feet away, you need more light to see than when you're sitting 10 feet away. So we try to determine the scope of the depth of the audience's view to, to determine, again, not to do a terrible job, but to do an adequate enough job, which we're always aiming above, <laughs> uh, is how much light do I need to deliver so that the people in the back can really see the story, can really see the person's, the expression on the person's face. And uh, that is usually attendant with the number of seats. Um, but the, the, the uh, answer to your question uh, from our perspective is that shows have been consistently getting brighter over time with the efficiency of the uh, quality of the equipment, the uh, efficiency of the optical systems that are used, the technology that makes them s smaller uh, and um, cools them, uh, a lot of practical um, uh, elements that go into modern lighting equipment has rendered them brighter machines. And what, what, what unfortunately happens is that 
the audience comes with an expectation of a certain amount of brightness, not just to see, but to be uh, um, inspired by. And it's difficult in, a, in, a, in an environment like Broadway uh, or uh, big theatrical communities to do something that is less bright because you couldn't afford it. In other words, you know, just because it's cheaper to make it less bright to use fewer lights. Uh, we need to kind of uh, go with the flow in terms of what the audience expects visually, brightness-wise. So that's also increasing. So um, what we try to do, you know, Broadway theaters will, will never get any bigger than they are physically. We can't just add more lighting equipment. So we try to be smart about balancing uh, the quality of light, the brightness of it, and the cost of it. and and. Uh, I think the, the, the newer technology is, has added generally to the cost of lighting and, and probably will continue to do so. Well, I want to talk about budget sort of obliquely in another way, which is about how you make your lives in this field. It seems to me that the designers that I know are always constantly going somewhere else. <laughs> How many shows a year do you have to do to make a living? Obviously, there's some balance. If you've got a Broadway show, it's going to be different than if you're doing regional work. But, but is it a vagabond life to some degree? Jess? Oh, very much so. But I don't know that we all take on so much work f for the money. It's just that you want to do those shows. I don't think, I mean, maybe not when you're starting. You, you need to take on a lot of a lot more work just to, to make a living, but I, I still work a lot more than I probably need to financially now just because there are projects that interest me and I, and I um, or it's a director that interests me um, that I want to work with. So um, I do way too much work, but you know, and I, I'm hoping kind of really to kind of curtail that a little bit in time to come, but who knows, you know. David, you're just back from San Francisco. Is, are, you, are you jetting around a lot? I am jetting around a lot. I, I saw Jess in a diner in San Francisco two days ago. Uh, I, I still haven't made a living, ever. Uh, I, I do somewhere between 12 and 30 shows a year. And even as the shows get bigger, uh, I find that uh, I'm still drawn to do the work. I mean, I think it's what Jess said. It's about relationships. It's about, it's about uh, exploring things in your work and as an artist that you want to continue to do. Um, a little bit in New York, unless it's on Broadway, you, you sort of pay to be here. You, you actually make less in town than out of town. So I think that draws people out of town. I think also just the size, and size of the theater and the scope of the theater and the types of budgets they have out of town, uh, the type of work they do out of town is really I mean, you're talking out of town, are you talking about the regional theaters? Are you talking about touring productions? Both. I mean, I just think that you know when you go to a city and they have two major theaters there as opposed to 200, those theaters are well supported and large and beautiful, and uh, they have year-round staff that take care of you. You know the the types of plays they do there. Oftentimes, you know, when was the last time you saw uh, an off-Broadway version? You know, that was really well supported of a classic play or something to that effect. Um, but the money is better out of town, I think. Um, so it's it's a whole bunch of different reasons why you why you take that that work and where you go. You know, I think I also want to say I think for me, what, one of the things I love about my work is that I keep on moving on to the next production. That I don't, that I'm not working on something for six months or a year. I like that I, that I always have another thing to go on to that's different, and that you know that I can just bounce back and forth between a period show or a modern show, or you know, working with one director and then working with another director who's completely different. I think the variety of it is very appealing yeah, to me. I agree, and, and also if you have a low quotient of boredom. It's a wonderful, <laughs> well, it no. is a wonderful job because you could find yourself immersed in the 18th century and then the next thing you know, you'd be in the mm -hmm. I don't know, 1950 or wherever. Mm -hmm. So you're literally visiting different times and no. places. But I find that the travel is a drag. I mean, last night I was coming up on the train and I thought I'd treat myself to the Excella and we get to the middle of <laughs> New Jersey and the thing breaks down and literally they had to find another train and they had to bring it up against our train and we had and make a little bridge and we had to transfer. This was two and a half hours. And That's exhausting. frankly, it's you know, it's like one o'clock in the morning and you just want to scream. So if there were a way to transport ourselves, you know, that would be 
Well, if they invent that thing from Star Trek, it'll That's really... That's what we need. I'll be the first one to... You just have to write that into your contract. <laughs> <laughs> it really exists. I just haven't asked for it. That's right. But something that came up, when David says, you know, 12 to 30 shows, we often think of artists creating a project at a time, one canvas, one book. So inevitably, you're doing multiple things at once. When you talk about going from one era to another, that could be in the course of the same day. Derek, do you find yourself juggling Constantly. different shows? Uh, and people always ask about that. How do you keep these projects straight, or do you find it difficult to work on more than one project at a time? And the answer is yes and no. Um, there are times when it's very difficult to work on more than one thing at a time. There are times uh, in productions that are so demanding, you want to only be able to, you want to only focus on, on that particular production and shut everything out. On the other hand, um, uh, I find when, uh, and uh, that, that's rarely completely possible, but uh, you know, I, I don't do as many uh, shows as, as Dave just described, but I probably do you know, eight to 10 a year, um, and they're mostly in New York City. But uh, because of that, they're always gonna be overlapping. Um, you know, some of them I work on for a long time. Some of them are two years in gestation. Some of them are, are shorter periods of time. But I actually find that the, for the most part, except for those times when I really need to focus solely on one thing, I find that the overlapping quality is really stimulating. I find that, um, you know, uh, I work hard on one project for a while sketching and I'll get stuck and I'll, you know, reach an impasse with my imagination for a few minutes. And so then I say, well, that's fine. I'll just go work on this other show for now. And uh, it's, you know, I'm forced to enter a completely different world, um, you know, perhaps a different period, a different uh, milieu, and a different director, a different playwright. And as I start to think about that work, uh, you know, sometimes it frees up something on the thing that I was just stuck on. I think we're always working as on the computer in background. Uh -huh. You know, so whatever sh whatever solution you can't quite get your hands on, when you go do the other whatever else, that continues to percolate in, in its background. And when you return to it, you've actually probably got the answer without consciously sitting there and I struggling. I think that's absolutely right. It, you know? And in these multiple projects, do you also have the opportunity to go back and forth between theater and other disciplines. Peggy, I know you've just, you said you spent four months working on the film of Dreamgirls. So you're even outside of the theater. Is well, I mean, I, among the lighting designers that I'm friendly with and uh, have relationships with, uh, we all do multiple kinds of lighting um, because um, it, it, we all find something else besides theater stimulating, whether it's you know opera, dance, or film, or uh, and we all uh, do want to diversify ourselves so that we can relax about being busy all the time and just be busy all the time instead of worry about mm -hmm. you know pie piecing it all together. One thing for lighting designers is, as I mentioned before, we think of it as on demand. And lighting designers have um, a limited amount of overlap possible, or at least from, from um, my perspective, because it's like pitching. It's uh, it, it, either you're doing it or somebody else is doing it, but somebody can't do it for you. Somebody can't play the piano for you. You're playing the piano or somebody else is playing the piano. So, so we have to be very careful about making sure that we are present in the theaters that we're supposed to be present in because, again, it's on demand. We're creating in that moment. We're not creating it yesterday or tomorrow. We're creating it right now. So. Um, We've got two heads about it as well in terms of, you know, wanting to be able to relax and maintain uh, our, our busyness and support our families and, um, and also uh, not getting, I love uh, doing um, live music industry, pop shows, concerts. It thrills me. And I feel that going uh, away from theater and coming back to it is what keeps me interested. So it's a little bit of the same thing of going across a vast time period in a short amount of time. You know, you you, you turn your office chair around and you're in another you're in another <laughs> set or you're in another you know set of costumes. Uh, it's the same thing for us. It's uh, it, it's it, it's um, it's stimulating artistically. So I think it, it it feeds both the financial and the artistic side. Jess, you've done uh, a couple of films. Mm -hmm. Is 
is the process of design for film different than the process of design for the stage? Um, you know, I, I'm asked that so often, and my students at, at, are always saying, like, how, how do you design for film? In, like, it's a different kind of art. And it really isn't at all, because you're still dealing with the character and with an actor and, how, and helping a, an actor create a character. And um, I think the thing that's different is obviously the camera picks up maybe some different things than, than, than a, 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 an audience in a theater does. But it's also no different than designing, the difference between designing in an opera house and designing in an off-Broadway theater. It's just a, it's sometimes it's really just a matter of scale. Um, so the, I think the design part of it is really just training your eye to what the scale is. What's very different in, in film is just the, the personnel and the, and the and the, the, the politics of the whole thing is, is very different from theater. And, um, uh, and as difficult as theater can be, I think film is far more difficult in terms of dealing with all the people and all the different opinions and all, all, the, all the stuff that has nothing to do with costume design, actually. That, that, I think that's what makes film dif difficult, um, m m harder than, than theater. Carrie, have you worked in I, I, I really have just done maybe maybe two and a half, uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm by no means an expert. I found, uh, I found the hours mm -hmm. grueling. The fact that you have to be up and dealing with uh, the actors in their most vulnerable, which is the moment before hair and makeup, <laughs> um, and that is 6 a.m. And you literally have to function the entire day, and uh, you, you have a, a a system where the, the setup is basically driven, uh, I think, more by the, um, the art director and the needs of the, of the film crew in terms of having a location which is rented for X amount of time. And if you have three or four different things you have to accomplish in that location, uh, somebody is going from young to old or someone is growing in pregnancy, any of that. Uh, any, and I don't know how the actors do it, how they develop the characters throughout. But you're going to do it all in a very compacted period of time because the props are rented and, um, and the set is, uh, if it's a location, the set is rented. So it, I think it's hard on us as costume designers and very hard on the actors. I don't know how they do what they do. I don't know how they, um, I don't know how they get to where they have to get in the intensity in which they have to do it and do it over and over. I mean, it's extraordinary. They deserve the big bucks, I guess. Um, but it's, uh, it also, frankly, if you're with a wonderful group of people for six months, for 14 hours a day, six days a week, and they're wonderful, that's good. Um, and you have a great time. If you are with uh, a group of people, some of whom are, um, certifiable, which, <laughs> which could happen, then, you know, six days a week for six months uh, could be very difficult. So uh, I like the, the timing of the theater um, mm -hmm. because the rehearsal period is so much more compact and the, the progress is direct, you know, and the order, the sort of intellectual order of the storytelling, even though you might in the beginning, you're going to break it up, and you'll do, you know, musical numbers, and you know, you'll do songs. But you can get the sense of the building of the whole so much easier. Since what we're talking about is a little bit about versatility, and you are all certainly versatile in what you do, when we talk to actors, inevitably sometimes the subject of typecasting comes up that if you're looking for a certain type of performance or certain actors are perceived as doing a certain kind of work, do you ever run the danger or have you ever been in a situation where people start to look at your work and say, oh, I need a 19th century interior and you know who's great at 19th century interiors. Mm -hmm. Derek, have you ever been in a situation or have you had to fight the idea that you can't do the broadest range of work? Uh, I, well, I absolutely fight it, and uh, I... Uh, what do you think people come to you for specifically? Well, last, you know, a couple of years ago, I felt like people were often coming to me to do 19th century uh, shows that were set in the 19th century. Um, <laughs> but some of that, I think, is just sort of coincidence, uh, you know, and uh, sort of peculiar timing. Um, 
Uh, but I think I think all of us, you know, resist pigeonholing uh, and, and and typecasting. We want to be able to do the biggest variety of, of work that we possibly can because it's more interesting. And uh, I think that's. Uh, I personally take pride in in, uh, in trying to invent a style for every production that I work on. I'm really not interested in imposing my style, whatever that is, onto a. Uh, onto a show. I'm really interested in trying to discover that anew each time. David, do you? I agree. I, I, I don't know that I've been typecast, although I feel like if you have a large commercial success in one genre, people might be more apt to come back to you. You become the guy that does cartoons or mm -hmm. you know, hyper-realistic things. Or, um, I think that I've had moments and pockets of that in my career. People say, oh, he does an environmental sort of thing, or he does that. Um, I try, like Derek, and I'd like all of us to sort of resist that. Um, I am pretty uh, flexible, and I, and I think I'm malleable, and also not just with the theater work, but also with film and, and all sorts of other things. I mean, there are certain designers that don't have transferable skills. People only do theater. They only do film. And I've been lucky enough to be able to cross over into furniture and interiors and renovations and photo shoots, and I do about a film a year. So I feel like it's just about flexing different muscles in the same way that doing a cartoon set or a realistic interior set is just about flexing different muscles. I think if you were pigeonholed and had to do those realistic interiors all the time, that would get boring. Um, I think that there is true joy, or I find true joy, in putting the dust in the windowsill and putting the you know, stamp on the night table and all that. But there's also true joy in doing the huge, slick, completely minimalistic thing. So I think we just try and stay fresh. But there is also a certain aspect, especially when it comes to period work, of research. You have to learn about that era. And so for I was going to ask the costume designers, does that lend itself to this because then you've already developed the, the knowledge base to work in that style or in that period. Do you mean that that would lead to, does that to lead people to, going to, back to you to for the same? People going back to you or, or does it ultimately make it in some ways easier for you to work? Oh, it definitely makes it easier because certainly now I, d I don't, um, you know, I've done enough, I, I've done, I feel like I've done every period that, that <laughs> plays can be written in even though I'm sure I haven't, but it, so I feel like I don't need to do quite as much, much research, but I still always, I still always do it, because you just, you just, you, well, that's I think, part of the fun. Yeah, and you yeah. find, I think, you get it, to when, look when, you re, books. when you revisit a period five or ten years later, you're, when you're older, you see a period maybe in a different way, or you, you see it in terms of today's clothing differently, so, um, yeah, so I, I think, even though I, I, I Maybe I, I do less research. I, I, I do think about each, each, each period I revisit differently, if that makes, makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would say I, I think probably if you enjoy doing it, you might, you might do a bit more. And certainly if you're in a period uh, that you've done commonly, uh, then, then you probably could, could begin drawing, but I always like to go back to it. I want to refresh it. I want to. Um, there might be another great book out there that mm -hmm. I haven't yet seen. Um, I love going on the internet. There are the sources uh, that you you just. It, it's remarkable what is now at our fingertips, and you could do it at you know three o'clock in the morning as opposed to in the old days. You had to wait for the library to open up, um, and you had to make an appointment. So. Um, there's an awful lot of great stuff out there. That doesn't begin to mean that the particular design would be based in realism. I mean, it's not necessarily that, because it's only a starting point. And the, the springboard and wherever you go from there has to do with those conversations you have with the director, the conversations when you finally do see the set, um, the conversations, I think, for us, if we are able to talk to the actors, or even I sometimes request at least a picture, um, and not those eight by 10 glossy things, but you know, like a real picture of the real person. All of that stuff is gonna skew what the research might start with. But I remember getting typecast for a while. People would call up and say, well, we have a rag show, <laughs> and, and you're, so, you're so good at rags. Um, <laughs> 
So Everybody has a niche. There you go. <laughs> and thank God. In our last couple of minutes, I want to come back to something that we talked about really at the very beginning. I was asking how you came into the field. And now, Jess, you teach, uh, certainly. How, what is your responsibility to bringing up the next generation? And as people who may have assisted or were engaged in, what, what do you look for now in the people who work with you? And, and how much opportunity do you have to bring them along? I want to ask Peggy, and very quickly, because you also have a unique story of sort of having come to New York and wanting to apprentice yourself to someone who's now your, your working partner. Yes, right. But now what do you do for, for the next generation? Well, we, um, w uh, my partner Jules Fisher and I have a studio, uh, and we have taken the approach together that um, since I really was, I worked as his assistant for many years and slowly became a design partner and now ultimately we're, we're um, business partners. Um, uh, I feel a great responsibility toward it because I think that's how I got here and I pride myself in um, bringing pe people, many people into the studio to work with us in the hopes that by being exposed to, to how our business works, uh, they can get on their feet in terms of understanding how the business of lighting design works. And I'm very proud to say that there are two Broadway lighting designers, working Broadway lighting designers, who started out as my assistants. And my goal is to um, cultivate um, a, um, a, a group of, of designers um, so that when I'm in Las Vegas and I'm supposed to be in New York, uh, and something needs to be finished, I can call one of these terrific people who we all work together and say, could you, could you get out there and, and uh, sit, sit in on a rehearsal because there are going to be questions or whatever it might be. And um, uh, um, I, we sort of want to make it like the you know, um, European architecture studios um, mm. where um, uh, people actually come from us. You know, and, and, and um, uh, that, that's what we, we hope our legacy will be. J Jules certainly uh, uh, cultivated many Broadway lighting designers, many who have been up here uh, on the stage. So um, uh, I'm following along. I, I love the idea. Derek? Uh, you know, I'm always interested in meeting uh, young designers. Uh, I need a lot of help in the studio making models and drafting and uh, various things like that. And, uh, uh, I'm excited by people who are talented in some way. You know, they're, 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 they have great ideas, or they, they draw well. Um, one thing I found is interesting is that working in the studio, the people who are uh, uh, really good assistants are not always the people, not always the same people who become yes. good designers. They, sometimes they're the same people, and sometimes they're people who are better at studio work, um, but they don't have the, I don't know, whatever it is, the. Um, the, the people skills or the ability to think quickly on their feet or the lot maybe at the luck I don't know th that, that allows them to actually survive as as designers they're just more comfortable working and uh, working in a studio so uh, it's interesting because it's fascinating to hear what Peggy has to say because um, uh, then maybe it's a little different in lighting design than it is in set design I'm not sure David advice for up-and-coming designers uh, well, I assisted Derek, <laughs> uh, and, and I don't know if I was a good assistant. He was a terrible assistant. <laughs> uh, um, he was a good designer. I, I try and do as many things like this. I mean, I try and talk about the work and the craft and the career, and I, and I, I think, uh, you know, advice for a young designer, geez, pick another career? No. Uh, I, I think, I actually say know, that. you have a responsibility <laughs> to study and learn and read and see as many things as possible and just sort of sponge life. Because I think what we do is essentially life, but bigger on stage. And I, I think just you know, staying power is the only way to really be able to forge a career in this. I think just continuing to do it, find a way, whether it's you know other mediums, but find a way to just keep working. Carrie, I heard you say under your breath, you tell people <laughs> to find another career. If I, I think it takes, it's not very glamorous, really. You have to be able to do very long hours. 
um, unless you're you know, doing a show that has such money that you can delegate an entire team to do it for you. You have to have a tremendous resilience and strength. Um, a 12 to 14 hour day should be average. Um, you have to be um, not interested in making a lot of money because I I'm excluding uh, movies and television for the moment because generally speaking the numbers aren't big and even on the Broadway shows there is a huge gamble there so you might do a Broadway show it doesn't mean you're going to uh, be rich and put a pool in your backyard and I, I truly hope that they will hear that it isn't that glamorous and that the money isn't that good and if there is something else that you can do um, that involves art and maybe is part of theater but is not this, you would be wise to do it because this is so tough. Now at the same time as, uh, but, and takes the drive, a tremendous commitment, there's a lot of that kind of stuff. At the same time as I do uh, urge them to think more than twice. Um, I'm, I'm proud that I hope uh, this year I should knock on wood somewhere that two of my students will be getting costume design nominations for their work on two shows on Broadway. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hoping, I'll, I'll be really unhappy if that doesn't happen, but there are two of them out there, um, um, uh, the Color Purple and the uh, Drowsy Chaperone are both uh, my students and I'm thrilled for them, but I think that the two of them couldn't have done something else. This is what they wanted to do and they've been doing it a long time. You, you have to feel that way. Well, by the time this airs, everyone will know what has oh. <laughs> occurred with your students, <laughs> and I'm gonna let this be the last word for our panel on designers. The American Theater Wing seminars are brought to you by the American Theater Wing in partnership with our longtime friends at CUNY TV, as well as in association with the CUNY Department of Continuing Education and Public Programs, and I'd just like to thank our panel for being with us today. Thanks for yeah. creating great worlds for us. Thank <laughs> you.